Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode on the Being Human podcast. Scott St. Marie here, and we'll get right to it. This is a very, very important topic, one that hits real close to home. So I'll get right to it because we're all lacking a little patience. It's true, though. This isn't a 15 second clip, my friends, but we're going to get real deep, and I promise you, I promise, oh, we're I'm going to hit you right in the feels, right where you live. And that's what happens when we cry. What is crying? Crying is that moment in time where something hits right where you live at that particular moment. Like you couldn't get from the left by a quarter of an inch to the right quarter of an inch. It hits you in the exact spot where you're living. You know, when you have that day, and it's been a heck of a day. Oh, so much happened. The boss didn't look at you and you put in all that work. Coworkers gave you a dirty look just because you walked in with a bit of mud on your shoes. Big deal. You didn't eat lunch, so you felt a little edgy. And then you went and got lunch and you got a delicious burger from five guys. But then the burger dropped on the sidewalk. You went home for dinner. Nothing was made. You didn't have anything in the fridge. You sat on the couch thinking, my life today was terrible. Then a friend calls you and says, hi, how are you? And you're like, good, good, good. Just see it in one of those days. And they're like, hey, no, how are you? <gasps> oh, I'm doing okay. <laughs> it gets you right where you live. And this question is perfect for actually that little scenario that just came out of there. So I'm going to read a question from a subscriber today. And it's something that we've all experienced. And one reason to turn on your notifications on all platforms, not for my need of attention, but for, for your benefit, if, 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 off, if you had a question that you wanted answered on this podcast, I put in the community tab on YouTube, which doesn't show in people's feeds. Um, I put, uh, hey, if you have a question, here's my email. I put in the community tab and then people sent me emails with questions. How cool is that? Internet's wacky wonderful. So if you have a question, uh, turn on the notifications and subscribe, like, whatever. Ask a question in the comments. And I think this is a theme that I'd like to pursue where it's a question answered, something awesome, and then a meditation. Because why? Oh, yes, we create space in between pieces of content. Space with the meditation, right? Piece of content. Soak in the content, the message for myself too. Take a break with the meditation. Create space in between information. Space in between information. That's what we need. But you're on TikTok, you're on CBC News, you're on CNN, you're scrolling through. It's a scroll massacre. It's information after information. It's article after article, headline, headline, video, video, picture, picture, Will Smith slap, Will Smith slap from the left angle, Will Smith slap from the right angle. You can't create space. We need space, man. So that'll be, uh, yeah, some kind of recurring theme. I think it'll be cool. So let's answer this question. And if you have questions, again, email is on YouTube and stuff, scottsaintmarie.com slash contact. My question to you is, oh gosh, Scott can't read today. Hi there. Hope all is well. All is pretty well today. Uh, had a ginger tea, glass of water here. Uh, went to the gym this morning, had a great swim. Man, there's someone next to me swimming. They were making waves. Don't make that many waves in a public pool, okay? Phelps, you got freaking Daffy Duck feet making splashies. I'm choking on water on the right lane. Chill. Okay, so hope all is well. My question to you is how do you deal with loneliness after you've tried coping skills X, Y, and Z? You've exercised, cried it out, written in your journal, called a friend. They tell you the same thing. Your time will come. Don't rush. It's God's timing. 
And usually when it's bad, it's not always bad. Sometimes it's just a fleeting moment. But when it's bad, it turns into a story about how I'll never get to experience love and what it's like to be a mother, which is all I've ever wanted. I told my friend today this process is no longer hopeful and beautiful. It's a burden that haunts me daily. So maybe my question is different. How do you deal with living with the fact that what you want most in life is not guaranteed? I think we should focus on the first one and I'll comment gently on both of them, and especially the second one, because, you know, I, I don't want to overstep and, and say something that, because that's a sensitive topic, you know, and I can only take people as far as I've been, you know, with, with coaching and things like that. I'm not a therapist. So if someone, if someone is like, Scott, I'm dealing with this, I'm like, you know what? It's my job to support people in the way that I feel is best for them in my experience. And if what's best for them is to be like, I think that question is for somebody else. That's definitely what I'll do. So I'll leave it. Maybe I'll say a few things about that. But the loneliness piece is huge. Think about that scenario, everyone, about going to work and you had the mud on the shoes, people giving you a dirty look, your boss didn't notice you. This is big time stuff. This podcast is a hobby, man. YouTube is a hobby. It's fun. And what I really do is I provide presentations and workshops to students, parents, corporations, businesses, and all around mental health, emotional health. The big topic I always bring up every presentation for the last three, four years is loneliness. It's something that we don't talk about, but everybody feels it from time to time and some people more than others. And if we look at depression and anxiety, these some of the time slash a lot of the time are symptoms of loneliness. I know. Even if you look at physiological symptoms, this is where it gets interesting. Obesity, increase, increased risk of heart attack and heart disease, uh, increased psychological stress and cortisol levels, high blood pressure, increased heart rate, all of these things, loneliness. This book by uh, John Cacioppo, Human Nature and the Need for Social Connection, is one of the best books I've ever read. If you don't have the patience for a book, it's all good. I get it. Uh, he's got a TED Talk. I would highly recommend looking at this dude. He spent so much of his life learning about loneliness. And I take so much of it to heart because it speaks to me so much. So loneliness, my friends, you said you've tried X, Y, and Z for coping. Great. Then some expression work, you cried it out, written in the journal, called a friend. You know, loneliness is something that requires necessarily a coping skill. There's a pretty clear antidote to loneliness. It's human connection, genuine human connection. You know, we have what's called these fringe friends. Fringe friends on Facebook. People that are just there, and, but you would never dare speak about something real deep with them, a real deep-rooted concern that comes from daily living and what it's like to be a human and suffer. They're just there. The antidote to loneliness is to find someone who gets it, who understands, who knows. So hear this definition and then you might f make sure you're seated for this one, everyone. Make sure you're seated. Don't be standing for this definition. Loneliness isn't the absence of people. It's the feeling that what you do and what you share doesn't matter to anyone. I know, I heard someone, his name's John. He was just like, hmm, interesting. I heard another person right there, her name's Jen. Yeah, Jen, I heard you go, hmm, interesting. I'll say it again. It's not the absence of people. It's what you do and share. It's what you do and what you share doesn't matter to anyone. You go to that office building that you work in all the time, your boss doesn't give a shit, coworkers don't notice you, you don't get any recognition, zero validation, zero attention, you go home, what did I just do for eight hours? What was that all about? No one cares what I did, what I shared, no one gave a damn. And they report feeling lonely. 
People in marriage report feeling lonely because, oh, damn it, I married this person and it's been five years, 10 years, two years, and uh-oh, I tell them my concerns, but they don't get it. They don't know me. It's just a mismatch. They don't, they don't, they don't understand what's going on on it's a different frequency i thought opposites attracted i thought just because she liked batman and i like superman we would have been a fit but the sense the gut feeling of oh that person knows oh they know you ever meet that person and you're just like wow i feel like i can tell you anything i had the best compliment i've ever received in my life the best one. I was in uh, Charlotte with a good friend of mine. We were at a bar. And uh, yeah, we were at a bar. Poof, man, almost, it was a rooftop bar. Almost jumped off, baby. That was a, the, <laughs> that was a scene. But it was fun, it was fun. And met these people and she said to me, man, you haven't met a stranger in your life. And I, and I didn't know what, I'd never heard that expression before. And then when my friend told me, I blushed, man. I was like, wow, that's exactly how I would like to be perceived and how I actually thought that this connection was going when I meet new people. Phew. It's not that I think I'm good with people. Oh, that's a good thing that they feel safe and comfortable too. And that is that antidote to loneliness when you meet someone who understands, where you click, and then you're not going through life alone. Now there's aloneness and loneliness. That aloneness is something else. That loneliness is like, oh man, I just got, I got a thing. It's a deep thing in the chest and it's that emptiness because I, I see the neighbors and there's a distance between me and the neighbor. There's a distance between of relatability between me going into Walmart and seeing the lady in a scooter getting white bread at Walmart. You know what I'm saying? Two different worlds. That's the loneliness piece. I can't talk to the lady on the scooter about certain things. So it's to find people that get it. And that's why peer support is so big for depression and anxiety. I thank goodness that I know people who deal with anxiety. I, I am so grateful for the last few years of knowing some people that had been through what I'd been through with uh, uh, spiritual stuff and depression and all of that because they could hold me for the time. So if you're going through depression or anxiety and you meet someone and they're like, oh man, I got a panic attack too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. When I was at that concert and then the clown came on stage, it was a Slipknot thing, but they had a clown costume. I was so triggered because I had the clown thing. I had the clown thing too. Oh my gosh. Just to go back and forth with people and there's a sense. It's not necessarily just a thought, everyone. It's a felt sense that they're like, oh, you get, you get it, you get it. Oh, I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one. And those people are out there. They're everywhere. And sometimes it just takes you or it takes me to say it out loud, right? Everyone, I'm scared of dying. And everyone's like, oh my God, let's go to them. Because me too, me too, me too. And then you got a tribe and you got a support group. So the loneliness thing, I'll say it one more time. It's not just the absence of people. People were reporting feeling lonely before COVID, before we got isolated and all that stuff in Canada and everywhere else, except Florida, lucky Florida. But it's the feeling that what you do and share doesn't matter to anyone. Make sure you find people that appreciate what you do, appreciate who you are, appreciate what you share with them. When there's a reciprocal relationship, when there's less judgment, when there's not a whole bunch of expectations in a friendship. You know those friends that you didn't, don't talk to for five years and you talk to them? It's like, oh, you're still there for me. I'm still there for you. Ooh, mutual love. And while I'm on the topic, people think that soulmates have to be of the opposite sex and they have to be your, your wife or your husband. That's complete bullshit. 
Soulmates can be of the same sex. They can be your best bud. I have soulmates and they're my buddies. Definite soulmates. He's on WhatsApp right now. Let me send him a message. Just send him the word penis. See what he says. Man, we've known each other since we were two years old. I've known this other guy for the last five years. This other person since 2015. Three people in my life for sure that just get it. And you know how you can tell when someone's a real friend? There's no political correctness. You can make big mistakes with your speech. And they know, oh yeah, he's just, that's, that's, he just messed up or he, he wasn't thinking or that's just him. There's no judgment or shame there. It's only understanding. I can say anything to these people that I wouldn't utter on YouTube or I'd be put in prison right now. That is so important for me and I believe for every human being to have a person in your life that is there. Other than a therapist, because guess what? When you leave that room, they're gone. Someone in your life that you can express the most outrageous, absurd thought. And they're there. I am so blessed to have people that I can talk the craziest shit to. It's the best. So that's a piece on loneliness that we have to decipher everyone. It's not necessarily just to cope with it. It's to take an actionable step to how can I bring people into my life where I can talk about bad, bad things too and they don't judge me. How can I bring people into my life that want the best for me and I want the best for them? I want to inflate them and they want to inflate me. And when I feel deflated, they take the pump and, and they pump me back up so I can keep on rolling, baby. That's what I'm talking about. That's what people do. They're there for encouragement to pump you up. They're there for sharing relatability, for understanding, for compassion. They're there for softness and gentleness. And guess what? You can't have one person do it all. You can have multiple groups and some of that is for family. Some of that is for coworkers. Some of that is for spiritual leaders in the church, in the community, in religion. You got to dip your toes in a few things to get the juices flowing all together for the thirst to be quenched. So listen, I'm happy for you because the loneliness is there, but that is something that you can actually take steps towards an antidote which is getting people that get it, finding those people. They're all over the place. They're looking for you too. I know they're looking for you. Based on your last question, you know, about being a mother, that's all I've ever wanted. That is a topic on every woman's mind in their 20s and 30s. That is a stress that I can't empathize with. So I don't necessarily want to comment on it. That is a stress, man. And there's controllable factors and there's uncontrollable factors, just like finding friends to decrease this feeling of loneliness. You know, there's an, excuse me, hold on. When I talk too much without breathing, I burp. Um, that's the thing too. It, it's about people with the loneliness, but finding a purpose too, like with the guitar, I feel less lonely when I play guitar because I'm creating, I'm sharing, I'm expressing, and it's not about me anymore. It's about something bigger than me. Oh, you know what this is? Come on. Hear that? Hear that? That's an E. I was raised up believing I was somehow unique. Like a sn- like a sn- no, like a snow. Oh, I gotta play this for you. I gotta play this song for you. Hold on. And some of you might already know it. Hold on. Because this lyric got me. It really got me. And I think it'll help you. And then you can listen to the song. Send me an email again being like, Scott, I'm bouncing up and down to the song. All right, here it goes. Let's go. I was raised up believing 
I was somehow unique Like a snowflake Distinct among snowflakes Unique in each way you can see And now after some thinking I'd say I'd rather be A functioning A fun- Oh, that's a minor. A functioning cog in some great machinery Serving something beyond me <laughs> La da da Okay. I I just when I think of loneliness there, it's it's about expanding your reach. You think about that. I was raised up believing that I was unique, a unique snowflake, but now I'm thinking that I could be part of something bigger than myself. I was at church on Sunday and um the priest, uh, it was a gospel of, oh my gosh, or actually the apostle, something I forget, but it was about you being able to do up your own belt when you're a kid and when you're growing up. And then as you get older, your pants get bigger, which is a funny thing to put in a Bible. Yeah, everyone gets fat, even in the year zero. And then you're no longer to do your own belt. This was the message to Paul or St. Peter. And God almost needs to do up the belt for you. And he's going to pull you in a place that you don't want to go. Isn't that something? It, it has everything to do with the feeling of control and our need for control and the ability and the need almost for surrendering at the same time. And you said God's will and leave it up to God. I don't, I don't think God wants us to just lay back, of course, and do nothing about it. It's your will, so I'm just going to eat potato chips. No, we know deep down that we can take the right steps to make certain things happen. I'm looking to find friends. I'm, I'm trying coping skills. I'm going to meet new people. I'm going to put my best foot forward gently, slowly, in due timing that's comfortable for me by pushing the limits and expanding the waist size once again. And... With the motherhood and everything too, you write the columns of what's in my control and what's outside of my control. And what's in your control is a lot. And do the timing based on what's in your control. What's out of our control is God's will, God's timing. You know what I'm saying? What can you do that's in your control? Looking for dates. How many dates can I go on in a week? What's enough to push my limit? What's too much? What's too little? What am I comfortable with? You know, it's literally about doing everything you can within reason that's in your control to advocate for yourself and get what you really want. Now, what do you want versus what God wants? That's a whole other topic. But you think about it. If I woke up tomorrow, see, I, I'm on a different end. I don't necessarily know exactly what I want. But what's funny, uh, my friend who wrote this question is, my uncle was a history teacher for a long time. And he said, I'm like, oh, I don't know, Uncle Bob. Of course, I have an Uncle Bob. I don't know. What do I want to do? Everyone, like this person, he was 14 years old. He knew he wanted to be a doctor. This person was 20. He knew he wanted to be a gynecologist. He just knew it. Yeah, I wonder why, sicko. But how do these people know what they want to do? He says, Scott, sometimes people just know. And they just walk through life and they know exactly what they want. And they just go. You want to be a doctor? I'm going to med school, university. I'm going to do my residency. And then I'm going to get a family practice. And blah, 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 blah. Other people stumble through their lives. They trip over their life. And that hit me so much because I'm someone who's tripped over life in a good way. We walk on a certain path and maybe God's the one who just puts a curb right in front of us and we trip, fall on our face, <laughs> and we discover something new. And we get up. Maybe we turn around. Maybe we find a different path. It's okay to trip over your life and discover new things. You just do what you believe is right and do what is right in front of you. We're such a forward-thinking culture. 
We're never pleased about where we are. You know? If I'm not pleased as a, a single male, I'm not going to be more pleased as a father and a wife and 10 kids. No. To find happiness with what we're doing right now, in this moment, and who we are now. That's the practice. And then take things as they come. Put your best foot forward into what you can control, what you can't control. Have a layer of God and spirituality there for you. But take a right step forward. And I think, you know, through meditation and focusing, that's what I do with people. I don't think people know what I do. Yes, it's the public speaking, but when I coach one-on-one, -on -one, if we're in a call, I just don't know where God starts and where I start, where he ends, where I end. What do I want? What do I control? What do I want to really happen? Oh, there's, look at this book right here. Gosh, another one, focusing. And you sit into the moment first. You don't go analytical like crazy, like therapy already. Well, tell me about your father, huh? Tell me about your mother. You don't have to go into that right now. That's not what I do anyways. I'm not trained for that stuff. What do I want? What, what can I really control? How many dates should I go on? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'm the one you come to when it's like, and I'm, I need to find someone else for me too, when I don't know. And if you were to come to me, my friend, and I don't know, you sit with that. You feel what's there. And I guarantee you, we lead you into being like, oh, oh, oh okay, that's what I can do now. Oh, yeah, that, that feels right. Take it easy. Be gentle. You know, this loneliness thing and these concerns are so human. Especially in the world we live in today with social media and everything. It's like we're just nonstop looking at everybody else's life. And uh, I guarantee you, everyone goes home and they watch Squid Game and they, they piss on the seed and they're eating chips. And we all feel lonely from time to time. The person that doesn't eat chips, that works out, that has great friends, family, job. We all get that feeling sometimes it hits us even when you have all of life figured out the point of being human is we'll always search for more we are all seekers don't stop seeking don't stop go at your own pace it's not a race go at your own pace sit with yourself a little bit but offer yourself that kindness because in this question oh, we're going on like 30 minutes here in this question, you said, you know, I'll never get to experience love or what it's like to be a mother. I'll never get this. Stop. That's a point in my, in my psyche where I need to be hard. Where, sorry, the video just cut out. Where I need to be hard with myself almost. Not out of hate, but out of firmness. Enough. You're done. I'm never going to be a father. I'm never going to be happy. I'm never going to be able to do this. My body's in so much pain. I'm never going to be able to play this again. Done. That's enough. You've gone down the rabbit hole. That's enough. You've dug. There's nothing down there. Stop digging. What are you looking for? When you find yourself in that loop, an awesome quote is, uh, I think it was by Nietzsche. He's like, the most courageous thing to do sometimes is to stop at the surface. <gasps> we think it's courageous to dig deep all the time and to see what's under. No. It's sometimes the most courageous thing to do. I can't be a mother. I'm never going to find love. I'm never going to get a date. That's all whatever. Stun enough. Back to the task at hand and what I can control. That's a critical part of me that, you know what? That needs to just stay over there. Let me keep doing what I'm doing for now what's right in front of me keep up the great work and thank you for your question my friend and uh this was fun and if you have any questions remember uh, scottstmarie.com and free videos and courses and personal coaching all the links are are there if i can be of service to you take care